I'm going to try not to stand in the way of the real reason we're all here, which is getting to the finals. But I do want to, based on some of what I heard, I kind of tailored the, uh, the presentation a little bit. I want to talk just a little bit about some things that might be interesting to you. And there's lots to talk about when it comes to sales and careers. And an old guy like me has a lot to talk about, been around a long time. So I try to narrow it down, talk about things around why you'd even think about sales. And I'm sure you all have your own reasons. And I heard some of them in the individual discussions that I had with all of you. And they're good reasons. These are some things you may or may not have thought about. A uh, little background, I, you know, I, I call it living the dream. Uh, it's a kind of tongue in cheek because some days are very difficult and confusing and some days are really very rewarding, but ultimately it's what we all, if you choose to do it, it's what you choose to do, so you need to embrace it. A um, little bit about ADP, and I know you all know uh, enough and some of it will be old, some of it will be new. Uh, brief, brief about ADP. And then just some things that are happening, well, it says the future, but really it's stuff that's happening now. Uh, and if it's not happening in, in some sales organizations, it will eventually because it's, it's the way of the profession. Hopefully, uh, if there's room at the end or if you guys are interested, I'd love to be able to answer any questions too. And by the way, if something jumps off at you and you want to ask the question right now, feel free. There's no, no rules around you know, me talking to the group. I just want to keep it interesting. So you've opted in to start looking at and exploring sales as an opportunity, as a career. Um, and you're thinking, you know, it's great, it's awesome. And I'm thinking, why would you want to do that? Because sales means you're going to have a quota, right? A quota. That's the number one thing associated with sales, which means you have an annual quota, which if you do the math means you have a monthly quota. And if you're, you know, really thinking, you've got a weekly quota, maybe even a daily quota. That means every day you're measured against the number. Every day, every day you're driving home from work and you're thinking, did I do the six things I needed to do today? Did I talk to the right amount of people? Did I say the right things? My boss is going to call me maybe on Friday because we have to report our numbers on Monday and say, you know, where are you at? And you're thinking, oh, I don't have enough this month or this week or today. So why would you purposely put all that pressure on yourself? Right? And you all have your reasons, but there's a couple reasons. First, I think it's a great foundation and a career option. What does that mean? A great foundation. You can find stats anywhere that say somewhere from 50 to 80 percent of the top people in an organization up to the CEO level either started out or went through sales. That's a really powerful thing to know. And the reason for that is because sales is really the essence of business. You can have a great product and if you don't sell it you don't really have anything to do. But there are instances where you might not have that product yet, but if you're out selling, money's changing hands, you can have a company. So it teaches you the essence. You're the closest person to the customer. It's the essence of business, selling. So it's, it's a great foundation. Even if you don't want to stay in sales, it can lead you into leadership roles across the organization in different functions. And of course, it's a great career option. You know, someone like myself and there, and there are other folks who can make a whole career as an, either an individual contributor or as a leader in sales. So you have kind of a dual career path and it sets you up well for both. That's important to know. Uncapped earning potential, I think that's probably the, one, of the, one of the big things in the room is you think, wow, I can make a lot of money if I'm in sales. And not just because I get a high base, but it's, the base is actually probably the third thing on your mind. You want to think about how much you can make on the high end in the variable comp and then you know, what you're going to be selling and whether you can travel or what level you're going to sell to. So uncapped potential for earnings is important. Now, uncapped is a little bit of a, some places it might not be fully uncapped, but for the most part, you know if you're a top salesperson, you're probably going to be making the most of your peers. And in some cases, you'll be one of the highest paid people in the company. So especially as you move on in your career, it's not uncommon for top salespeople to earn more than the CEO. That's true. Control of your destiny. Now, I know having control of your destiny is, is kind of an illusion. Like, there's a lot of luck in our lives, and we don't know if, you know, everything's going to fall our way. But when I say control of our destiny, what I mean is if you're in sales, you typically have a number next to your name. And if they want to know, did Rob Dada have a good month or a good year, they just have to look at the report, and it says next to my name, 122% of plan. That means I'm doing well. And if I want to do really well, it says 160% of plan relative to my peers. And it also could say 81% of plan. So we have a saying in sales, you always want three digits next to your name because that's, that's the place to start. 
Control your destiny means if I want to move up, if I want to get recognition, if I want to make money, if I want to have the things that I wanted, whatever my goals were, you know, I can make that happen in sales. I can decide to pick up the phone and make one more call. I can decide to be extra prepared and wake up a half hour early. I can decide to get there on time. Those are within my ability to do it because there's a variable, and the reason we make more money in sales is there's a variable, a very important variable in that equation. Right? We're, we're a known entity. We're a constant. We can control that. The customer is the variable. They don't have to say yes. We can do everything we can in our power to make them say yes. And that's what I mean. When we control our destiny, we prepare. We are ready. We know what's to be done on that call, what's to be done in the process. And so we can control our destiny. Flexible schedule. Some of us, you know, we're not built to sit in a cube and talk on the phone and check out and punch in and punch out. For those of us that want to control our schedule, sales is a great way to do that. That means some nights you're going to be out late. You're going to have to entertain. You're going to have to wake up early the next day and present. You're going to need to be on. And it could be hard. But that also could mean that that Friday afternoon, your office will be on, and your, where you sign your deal will be the eighth hole of the local course. Right? Or it could be you know, poolside in a beautiful resort. And that's where work gets done also. That's where deals get made. And that could be where you are. So it's an important thing to keep in mind if you're not someone that likes the comfort of punching in and punching out, you have a lot more flexibility. Personally, you know, I'll only talk a little bit about my background today, but you know, in sales, and it's not just the places you go, it's the people you meet, it's the things that you learn about the businesses that you work with. It's, it's an unbelievable education. It's a lifelong education if you choose it to be that way in sales because you'll constantly meet new people. You'll be exposed to new industries, new processes. And you know, personally, I believe it's a very rewarding journey. So that's a very big thing. That's one of the reasons some people do pick sales. And then finally, which is also important because it's, it's really increasingly difficult to find typical job security. But if you're a really good salesperson, your phone will constantly ring. Recruiters will constantly call you. Friends will know that you're good and they will refer you to people in their company. You will always be in demand. Because as I said early on, sales is the essence of business. It's the foundation of the company's success. And if you're good, that means you can contribute directly. You can justify your existence every day, every month, and every year. And you will always be in demand. So, I'm sure that you guys maybe have other reasons, but these are some key reasons why you would want to think about a life and a career in sales. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, take it, you know, I, know, I know some years we've had speakers kind of give you a, a lesson in, in, in sales 101, or in some years uh, folks have maybe kind of talked about some of the fundamentals. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about, about my, my journey, what I, what I call living the dream earlier. So, I, uh, I was born in New York City. Uh, our family, we grew up in New York, uh, got a little old. We moved to Bergen County, New Jersey, not far from here. Uh, went to school there, played sports, which I know I've asked a, a bunch of folks here if you've played sports, and I know a lot have. I think sports is a really important part of the background of a successful salesperson, if only because it teaches you the true spirit of competition. If you don't prepare, if you don't work hard, you cannot win. You cannot hope to get lucky and win. And that's really the case in sales. You cannot just hope to get lucky. And it might work once in a while. You might get a great product one year, but that's going to run out. Competition is going to catch up. So played sports, went to university, and I, and I graduated. And if, you know, the first piece of advice I might give is at the time I graduated, uh, I graduated into a recession. So you know, if you can, try not to graduate into a recession. It, um, it was, it was hard, and, and it wasn't like 100 years ago either. It was, it was, a, nine. It was a nine in the digit. Um, and it was, uh, it was really bizarre because I was really smart, and everybody like, said, you're going to be great. And then all of a sudden, I was taking typing tests. And I'm like, but wait, I, I have a college degree. Why am I taking a typing test? And they're like, that, those were the jobs that were available. And you know, this was a difficult period. And so back then, um, the internet hadn't been invented by Al Gore yet. And so, <laughs> so I had to look in the, the WAN ads of the New York Times. So I was, you know, was going to work in New York City. And so 
I was looking in the, in the, we didn't have anything like this, by the way. And I went to a pretty good school. And you know there was none of this. You kind of wandered around with your resume, and you handed it to somebody. And then you didn't really have a great talk track. Like I've, you know, and I didn't hear anybody bad today. But the worst person I heard today was 20 times better than I ever was at your age. So it was, it's very impressive. But anyway, and I tried to get jobs. And finally, I got on with a, a senior broker at a local uh, commercial real estate firm. And, and this guy was like a legend. And he was selling these giant warehouses and in the Meadowlands and these big commercial spaces in New York. And he made a lot of money. And I said, I, oh, this is awesome. I could do that. I'll learn. And I went there. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, he sent me out. I, I came in the first day and he sent me out. He goes, you know, go, go to this area and, you know, bring back this. He gave me a list of information I had to bring back. And remember, there was no, yeah, you were all used to iPads and smartphones and all that. Back then, you know, these kind of tools, back then, I was the tool. Right? So I had to go out and collect all the data and knock on the doors, and I would bring it back. And you know, sometimes he would call me Ron. You know, and I was like, after six months and I was there, he's like, yeah, Ron, thanks. I'm like, it's, it's Rob. He'd be like, yeah, Ron, Rob, whatever. <laughs> so I was, you know, I'm like, I know I can do this. I can stick it out. And uh, you know, I was grinding. And you know, I, I, I would bring him some information. And eventually, you know, it, it, it made it through to be a, a deal. You know? And I was really excited. And at the time, I was working on a draw, you know. And you know, w when everybody got paid out, I was big deal. By the time it was done, you know, the, my my little crumb was like barely enough to pay my like for the gas it took me to drive back and forth all those times. So, I said to myself, okay, this. Although I'm learning good fundamentals about working hard, I'm probably not going to make a lot of money for a long time. And so I went back to those WAN ads again, and uh, you know, found another gig, and and it was it was with ADP, and you know. It was exciting because now I actually, back then, I didn't even have a desk. Now I had a desk and a cube that, like, you didn't, like it was kind of high enough that you had to kind of go like that. And I felt like, felt like a big office. So that was exciting. So I went in. I went through our training program, which was great. And they gave out territories on territory day. And my territory was Wall Street. And I was working in the New York office. And I was like, Wall Street, this is going to be great. I'm going to go down there, you know? So. So, you know, and that, that was kind of like what Wall Street was like back then. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's going to be me. I could be like in there, and I'll, be, I'll say I work on Wall Street, but really I, w I was working on 34th Street. But anyway, so I'd go see these guys, and they were pretty tough negotiators, as you could imagine. Now, this is, this is kind of still the recession. is coming up out of the recession. Um, and, you know, I'm going in there every day, and these are tough negotiators, and I'm getting beat up. You know, I'm, I'm coming, knocking on the door. I'm going in there, and I, I have a, I have, we don't have like any kind of automated system. I have car, they called cards back then, and you would get a D and B card down in Bradstreet. You get this card, and it was a big list, and you had a tickler file. Everything was paper. There was no automation, and so I would go down there, and I would have these appointments, and sometimes I'd get lucky, and they'd say yes, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to come back Tuesday and pick up the papers, and it would be like you know, 30 people when I left. And when I come back on Tuesday, I, I would like push the door open and all of a sudden there'd be like a couple empty coffee cups. I'd be like, what happened? You know, and there'd be like a sheriff's notice on the door or something because it was a boiler room and the thing disappeared. So the guy bought everything. I was like, this sale's way too easy. And it was. You know. So it was hard. And I'd go back and my manager would be like, hey, don't worry. It's a recession. It's a tough part. All the Wall Street firms are moving out. They're moving to Midtown. We just want you to learn. We want to cut your teeth. But it bothered me. It bothered me because I wanted to have a good number. And I was scraping by. I never wanted to have zero, but I didn't have enough. And I wanted more. And I was letting the team down, I thought. Even though he was letting me off the hook, personally, you know, I owned that number. I had a quota. I needed to contribute. So it was my first, to me, thing I thought about in sales. It's, it's a key word. It's accountability. You need to be accountable to your number. And I, yeah, it was very personal to me. I didn't want to just be OK. I wanted to be great. I wanted them to rely on me, not just tolerate me. And so I was trying to think of different ways that I could be useful to the team. I noticed other companies on the floor, they didn't have investment sounding names. They had names about the web, the World Wide Web. Because at this point now, Al Gore came around and invented it. And so what happened was all of this infrastructure that was left behind from, the tel from all the companies that were leaving that had done huge trading operations, that infrastructure was perfect for internet companies. And I didn't really know what the internet was back then, because nobody even had like AOL or anything yet. But it was just literally starting. It was the, those weeks and months were the beginning of the internet. So I, but I, these names weren't showing up in my DMV cards. How was I going to get in? The, the doorman would chase you out of the building. You couldn't just walk around. I made friends with the doorman. 
I couldn't get the information any other way. So I would become friends with the doorman. I'd bring coffee. And you guys maybe have heard these stories. But maybe once in a while, I'd bring them a, a, a hero or I'd give them a tip on a football pool or something. And they became my friends. And they gave me those names. And they let me in the building. And these folks, they wanted to buy. And I'd go in and I'd see them. And there'd be two kids in a t-shirt like my age, you know, with a pool table and a popcorn machine. I'd be like, they'd be like, hey, we need payroll for 500 people. I'd be like, there's only you two guys. And you're like, wearing t-shirts. So I had my tie on. You know, I was very successful. And these kids were like, don't worry. Trust us. There's going to be a lot of people here. And literally, sure enough, they'd buy a system. And in just a few months, there'd be three or 400 people in that room. And just a few months later, I'd see these kids on CNBC because they just brought their company public for like a billion dollars. And that's the truth. Like, these were, this was actually happening. So I got to see that. And by leveraging a new approach and really caring, not just giving up and being accountable, finding a new way, I turned it around. I didn't go straight to the brokers. And I found new ways to get the business because I was accountable to the number. And eventually, it was, it was a good run. And I did very well. And so I got to be kind of like my own little king of Wall Street. And it was you know, different. I wasn't Gordon Gecko, but uh, I was out grinding. It was a good lesson. Eventually, years went by. I had a choice to make, whether to stay as an individual contributor or be a leader of people, which you will all experience if you stay in sales at some point. There's a lot of great things to be said for both sides. I opted to become a leader of people. And so uh, things went well. I got different promotions. Eventually, I got to be uh, in corporate, which was great. Caught the eye of someone in corporate, learned a lot about things that happened behind the scenes. And then I got what I thought was the crown jewel eventually, and I got, to be, I got to be the leader of the New York office that I used to be a salesperson. That was like our crown jewel office. And I got to be in charge of sales there. And it was an incredible thing for me. I was very excited, and I was like thinking of all the great things that are going to happen, but then something, something pretty bad happened. Right? I think we know what happened. September 11 happened, and it was a terrible thing, obviously, for all the people that were involved, whether you were directly affected or not. But ultimately, the city was taking it. It was a severe blow to the people, to the industry. And it was a very difficult period. And so you know, for a couple of days, people were just stunned that we don't even know what to do. And our office is not far. We had a direct front row seat to what was happening. So we couldn't just, this was the number one producing office. We can't just you know, close the doors and say, we're not going to do it anymore. We got to be sensitive. There were people that worked in that office that, you know, that's just the number one office. So people come from around the country to work there. They got on trains, and they went home, and they didn't come back. They went to California or Pennsylvania or wherever they're from, and, and we had our own people not come back to work. So, you know, it's a very challenging time. But we had, to, we had to get people feeling like they could contribute. We had to get people feeling like their lives could be normal again. And so people really picked each other up. And they reached out to each other. And there are parts of the city that were completely closed off that my, my territory might have been. But other people said, you know what? I'm going to step up. I'll give up part of my territory. I'll let you work it with me. And if you can't get into work that day because they had restrictions on traveling, I will drive you. Or together, we could even maybe bring some of our clients in. And people reached out to each other. And there was those that remained, those that were left, they picked each other up. And they made a huge effort because they were working late and they were showing up early and there were bomb scares and we were getting chased in and out of the building and it was a very difficult period. But this was a, another key thing because you're going to need to think about it. In terms of accountability, teamwork. It's very important. Where as an individual contributor, you're going to contribute to a, a greater picture. And you might not want to be hugging everybody all the time, but you're part of a team whether you like it or not and how well you can work within that team. Sometimes it will benefit you. Sometimes it will cost you a little bit of extra effort. But ultimately, you put accountability and teamwork together, it's going to be very difficult to be beat. And we figured it out. And eventually, the city started on the path to healing. And that office got back to where it needed to be as the number one producer for the whole company. So it was a good lesson for me. So back on the, the road, found myself doing different gigs. Um, always new things every two or three years. When you do well, people are going to ask you to do more things and different things. Got a chance to be able to sit in front of 
uh, uh, after a while to go sit in front of our big boss and he said, hey, we have some offices that are doing well and we have areas of the country where nobody's doing anything. We don't even have an office. So I became responsible for what's called emerging markets. So I had to go out, domestic emerging markets, I had to go out and find new places where we could generate business, put people on the ground. That was great. That led to another job called agent sales where we then took not just our own sales, we trained other big sales forces how to sell our products. Never been done before in our company in 50 something years at that time. Great opportunity. That worked well. Then we went to a, an insurance business, which was completely different than anything I'd done before. The reason I'm telling you all these different steps is, as you look at it, there's all different things that can happen once you're successful at the job you're doing. So if you don't look too far ahead and you do the best you can in the role you have, it'll open up doors for you that you don't even know are there. That led to another call, a fateful call. One day I was driving home and I got a call from the big boss, the CEO. And he's from the South, he had a little draw. I knew his voice right away, he said, hey Rob, how you doing? I said, that's a Southern accent, I'm sorry if it's bad for those. That, <laughs> so so uh, I said, I'm, do I'm doing okay, Gary. Uh, he said, well, you know, we got a little opportunity we're gonna want you to, uh, to consider for us. And I said, uh, what's that? And usually he would just, this guy didn't mince words, he would just say it, but he didn't. He said, well, it's gonna be different than anything you did before. And I said, well, okay, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm up for it. I've done all these different things, I've been around. And he's like, well, you know, I'm gonna need you to think about this, but I'm gonna need your answer pretty quick. And uh, I said, okay, well, and you know, he was kind of stalling, we we're going back and forth, and I'm driving. And so finally I said, well, wh wh where do you want me to go? You know? And I think, you know, when he said it, it was, Whoa, so yeah, it was China. And so, you know, only because, you know, I, I didn't know we could sell payroll in China. I didn't even, it turns out we had acquired a company in China, the basis of what would become our operations. But they didn't have any, anybody that could go there. And so, uh, you know, he asked me if I would consider it, and I said, absolutely. I mean, I have to consider it. It's a big opportunity, it could be a big office. And he, I said, well, I'm gonna need some time to think about it. He said, okay, well, it's three o'clock, I'm gonna be here till five. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, and uh, you know, I did as much research as I could while I was driving. Um, and uh, you know, I, when he says five, it's five, uh, you know, I called him back and I said, unless you know, something changes, uh, I guess I'm, I'm game. And so 30 days later, uh, every, everything I had was in storage and I was uh, off a plane in, in Shanghai. And, uh, which is an incredible experience, which I could also talk about for hours and hours. It's a, it's a great place and uh, you know, a lot of challenges, et cetera. But there I am, and now it turns out I, I had taken some Chinese classes, so I, I spoke a little Chinese, I thought. Uh, and uh, you know, I went there, and when I got there, we had a nice little operation, but you know, a big open office, a lot of empty desks. My job was to populate those desks with salespeople and start selling our product. And it wasn't just sales, but it was also marketing, and, Part of it was product development, but you know, sales was the main, like I said, it's the only way to make that business successful is to sell something. So I was there a couple days and I, first night out, I thought, you know, I'm on my own now. My handlers, a lot of handlers when you go to China because you know, there's a lot of stuff you can't read and you don't mind not to say, but I thought, okay, I'm okay, I'm gonna go now on my own, I'm gonna go to the restaurant. Because I, you know, I can speak Chinese, I said. So in Shanghai, has anyone here been to Shanghai? Shanghai, a couple people? Okay. So in Shanghai, in the, in the taxi cabs, you sit in the front seat, right? So I, I, I get out and I go and I get in the front seat of the taxi cab and uh, I say, okay, I'm gonna ask him, I'm gonna go to the restaurant, get something to eat. <clears throat> so if anybody speaks Chinese, you'll know what I'm about to say is terrible Chinese. Uh, so I say, uh, right? It's bad, terrible pronunciation, terrible tone. So he says, it means he doesn't know what I'm saying. So, uh, and, and you know, we're in the front seat together, so we're pretty close. And, uh, I said, oh, okay. And meanwhile, he takes off. He's not waiting for me, he's just driving. <laughs> so he's driving in and out of traffic, which can be pretty crazy in Shanghai. And, uh, and oh, I said, okay, I regroup. I, I say it again, and I say, uh, uh, and it's bad again, bad Chinese. And he says, you know, he's like, he says, I don't know, right? So, so he's yelling at me now, and I think he's yelling at me because he's talking really loud, but I don't know what he's saying, and it's so fast, you know, and so, now I'm like really panicked because we're going fast and the meter's running and I don't even know where I'm going. So finally I'm like, whoa, you know, and I'm just like, just out loud in English, I just say, you know, I just wish you'd take me to the restaurant. He slams on the brakes, he gets about an inch from my face and says, why didn't you just say that? 
so it's like, yeah, so, so yeah, I, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, one, one, of the, one of the other key words in sales and in life is adaptability. Now, eventually, I, I, I did learn how to, to speak Chinese much better, and I was able to communicate. But, uh, you know, that was like my first lesson in, hey, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore. No offense to anybody that here is from here, Kansas. Or, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, uh, it was, you know, an incredible opportunity to test my own adaptability. And part of the reason I took the assignment, honestly, was because I wanted to know if I, if I really was good enough to do it. And that's something you'll ask yourself from time to time. And a lot of people, you know, they'll stay in their comfort zone. But you, I don't think you can really realize your true potential unless you go out and you see how adaptable you are. If you are, it's an incredible, it's an incredible thing to pursue. And so, you know, we, we had tremendous opportunity, but we had tremendous challenge. And we still do. And there, to any company that does business in China, it's a great big market. And there's a lot of people that doesn't guarantee you anything other than there's a great big market and there's a lot of people. There's, you, could, you could fail very easily. Things that seem so obvious you know, might not be. And so for four years, we worked every single day. We reviewed our strategy every single day. I had to throw away everything that I knew that I thought was successful. I had to keep certain characteristics. You need to be adaptable. You need to think about working in a team role. You need to be accountable to the number. Because nobody was expecting anything from China when we went there. They said, go see what Gary said. Hey, Rob, we don't know what we don't know. And he asked me, just keep us out of the newspaper over there. Right? That's all he wanted. He didn't want any trouble. So he wasn't expecting a lot. Right? You know, I wanted to make it big because it should be big. And so we worked very hard and we, we did a lot of new and different things within the framework of, the, of our company culture, within the framework of the area culture. Because there are things that play differently there. There's networks. You can't just go in and do a Ben Franklin and say, okay, this is the three reasons why it's good. Here's the two that's bad. What do you think? And someone says, yeah, no problem. You have to build relationships. You have to have a network, Guanxi, they call it. So there's a lot of things, and I'll be glad to answer any questions later on about that, about doing business in China, but there's a lot of things you need to do differently, and we did. And when we did, we put together a great team, and eventually we became very successful. We became the number one provider in the market for what we do very quickly, and we're growing every year in three-digit numbers, not just in plan and growth. So from there, just recently, I got the opportunity to come back to the US after about four years and take on a role as the head of sales operations worldwide for my company. So uh, I'll just give you a quick background on what that means. So there's sales and there's sales operations. Sales operations is everything that supports sales. So you have the direct person that goes out, makes a pitch to a, a customer, sells a product, how they got trained, what their comp is, whether they carry a laptop or an iPad, um, all of that is stuff that sales operations handles. Whether they use a campaign, how do they get the lead, who gave them the lead, um, what they're allowed to sell is these four products or these ten. All of that information, all of that stuff that happens behind the scenes belongs to sales operations. So how effective you are as a salesperson in any organization has some, some measure to do with how well you're supported. Because you could be really smart and sharp and know about your products, but you, sometimes you need help. And so that's what we do. So our group, Sales Operations Worldwide, supports 11 business units around the world. And you heard earlier, 8,000 salespeople. We do about 1.5 billion in new sales. ADP has you know, billions in revenue. But in new sales, each year, this year, we have $1.5 billion target. So you can see, I had to go around the world because I'm in an office that's probably 20 miles from the first office that I started in, but it's, uh, it was a, quite a journey around the world to get there. So a little bit about ADP. I know you know, you probably read some of this stuff when you did your research, right? But it's worth talking about because it's as ADP evolves, as the market evolves, if you think, and I don't know if anyone went this far back, you know, ADP started collecting information, hard copy, just paper. They would go have a driver pick up some ledgers and they would process information and then eventually very quickly they evolved to punch cards like believe it or not that was even before me and they would actually collect data and feed it into these mainframes and then 
you know, things change. Big mainframes that were, you know, the size of this room that today, like someone's wristwatch has more computing power, you know, and it evolved again. And then PCs came, and then the internet came, and then zero footprint came. And so on and on and on, ADP managed to evolve. And it's a key thing because, you know, when you talk about the snapshot of today, it's not easy to be around 60 years. It's a big deal, and especially in the business that ADP invented, outsourcing. So it, it's something that, you know, is, as we think about it internally, we never think, okay, well, we've been around a long time, so we'll always be around. Every year, we think about that year like we're as, we're as new as any other company, and we ought to be as hungry as any other company. That's the only way to stay around. So we're evolving again. We're thinking not just in terms of payroll. We're thinking in terms of HCM, and we change the question so we can change how we approach the market. It's a big deal. It's how to survive. It's also why we're one of the only four AAA rated companies. I think you might have seen that in your research. It's another big deal. For those that don't know, a AAA rated company means you can borrow money at the lowest possible cost because you're the least credit risk of not paying that back. Now, as it stands, ADP borrows almost no money. But it's something that ADP is very proud of. It means the company is very well run. There's very little risk in any of our finances which means we'll hopefully be around for a long time. We get awards. I mean, these are just a few. We get literally hundreds of awards every year across the full spectrum as an employer of choice, as a company that sets technology standards, as an innovation company in process, uh, on and on and on. Individual people win awards. It's something we're proud of. You know, there's just a few up here. But it's, a, uh, it's part of what makes the company successful. The people are successful. And that's part of something that's an internal culture. Our people are top people and makes the company good. I just wanted to take a minute to go over the vows. I'm not going to go through all of them. And we have a mission and a vision, and that's important to know. But you know, a couple things, if you look around, I don't know how, if you do research on the different companies that you're interested in working at, I, find out how many where integrity is the number one value that they list. It's very important at ADP. It's very important in life. right? But at ADP, any given night, uh, we handle money for our clients, uh, over 600,000 clients around the world. Any given night, there might be $30 billion in our flow pipeline. That means we're moving other people's money to the tune of $30 billion. We have to have integrity in the system. We have to have integrity in the people that work within the system. We capture very personal information on people. Their social, the most basic stuff, social security number, their pay, their marital status. In some cases, we have medical information. So we need to have the highest levels of integrity in everything we do. And everything is measured against that. That's the first thing we think about when we think about products or processes or how we deal with our clients or our individual employees. Inspiring innovation is another one that jumps out. It's more and more important to look at being innovative, not just in the market, but in your individual workspace. The things that you do, how can you do them better? ADP has a constant focus on that. It's something that you'd be well, you do well to learn and keep in your own personal life. How can you be more innovative in what you do? And then another one that's different, social responsibility. It's very big at ADP. They, as a company, are constantly looking out. Of course, we just had the recent terrible storms that came through. And ADP is a big uh, contributor uh, to the, all the fundraising that's gone on, also a lot of people hours. So they're constantly looking to get people out, doing work in the community. And it makes it interesting. And it's important to the company. It becomes important to you. And it's a very rewarding part, I think, of being able to work at ADP is because I have time to be able to contribute to things around the community that have to do with being a good social, uh, a good corporate citizen. ADP worldwide. I know some people have asked me already about opportunities worldwide. We do business in 70 countries right now. And that number grows probably every two or three months, either through acquisition or through some new innovation in one of our products where we actually are able to service another country. We have uh, over 55, actually it's closer to 60,000 employees now. And if you think about it, if you look at the map quickly, a lot of our revenue now comes from the US. So if it's 10 billion worldwide, maybe eight and a half billion comes from the US. So if I'm you and I'm thinking, looking at that map, that tells me there's a lot of opportunity in all those other circles. Right, around the world, and there really is. We're growing very quickly in all those international markets, but we could be growing twice as fast. And the only thing that holds us back is having good people. So it's a, uh, we can expand as fast as we can have good people in those markets. So 
Anybody know what that's a picture of? Shanghai, Pudong, exactly. Someone, hey, he actually got the neighborhood in Shanghai. Nice work. <laughs> that was just, yeah. It's, so talk about a little bit about the future. Um, you know, it's a, uh, things are constantly changing in every function, not just sales. But sales, because it's at the forefront of business, typically experiences those changes first and in some ways leads those changes in the business because you are right up against the customer. You're learning what's happening in the market in real time. You're hearing firsthand what the needs of the customer are. And the needs of the customer are the market. That makes the market. And that makes what you do important. And so if I look at the future, there are things that are happening that have not happened before. So if you think about a salesperson, start with that. If you look at that, you've got four salespeople. Which one of those is the top salesperson, was the top salesperson at their company? Who, who thinks A is the top salesperson in their company? One who won, really? B? C? Wow, C gets a lot of votes. That was like that guy I met, in the, the internet guy. D? The fact is, every one of those was the top salesperson in their particular function. So if you think about it, and hopefully you do, you all have a different style. Some people are better in a suit, and some people are better in a denim shirt and going out and talking about different elements of whatever it is they're selling. So for instance, in pharma industry or in the internet industry, you might have two completely different sales styles. If you bring your very successful sales style to the other, you will fail. Right? You show up and you want to sell seed you know, or whatever it is, some agriculture product, you, sell up, you show up in your suit, you're probably going to, the guy's going to, you know, not want to talk to you. He's going to probably think you're somebody from the government coming to take the farm. Who knows, <laughs> right? So you can't, so, and, and that's the truth, right? So you need to be very aware, and you can still be very successful playing within the rules of that particular industry. So there's no limit. You don't have to fit into a certain mold. As long as you're driven and prepared and professional, you can succeed. In the old days, this was, you know, this was all we had. We had the phone book. And when I say the old days, it wasn't even that long ago. We're talking about like 12 or 13 years ago. You didn't really have any kind of true data to, to go work against. Right? Now, this is what you got. You have full access, not only through the web, but through blogs, through social media, through all kinds of online resources, so that when you go in and sit in front of your customer, 70% of that decision might be made. You know, when I started, I was all the information they had. Maybe they talked to a buddy that had bought something, or maybe they went to a seminar. But all the information they knew, they either read in the newspaper or a salesperson told them. Now when you meet with a prospect, they're going to know a lot. They might know more about your company than you know. And they've spoken to three or four people, and they might have read something negative on a blog about something that you didn't even know your company did. So 70% of that decision is going to be made before you walk in the door. So your role changed in the process. You're going out there. You're not giving them information. You're not, the, you're not the walking brochure anymore. You've got to go in there, and you've got to ask different questions. You've got to ask provocative questions. You've got to change the whole story. You can't go in and talk about the fish on the wall or the picture of his kid graduating. You know That's not going to do anything. That's going to last a couple seconds. You've got to bring new perspective to the deal. If you don't, your competitor will. And if you tell them what they already knew because they read it on the internet or they had a brochure, you lost the deal. Unless they really, really want to buy it or you're the only player in that market. So you've got to go in. And, and I know some people in here say, hey, I'm going to be great in sales because I'm a people person. You know, I'm sorry, but that's, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. That's not going to be the thing that makes you successful. What's going to make you successful is being prepared asking provocative questions, and adding value to that buyer. Because that buyer, if they make a mistake, they're in trouble. So you're putting them in a precarious position. So they're going to size you up based on what kind of information you give them and say, hey, is this person going to make me look bad? Because if I say yes to what they said and it's bad, I look bad. Not you. They're not going to remember the salesperson when he has to go in and tell his boss why they didn't get payroll that week or whatever it happens to be you're selling. So it's a different game than it ever was. And you're going to need to be you know, very much aware of that. So 
you know, these are just some of the things. And we can go into talking about what they call the challenger profile, and I'm sure you've probably read about this. I saw some literature outside already that I think already consider advanced concepts in, in technology, technology-enabled selling and stuff around search engine optimization and things that the marketing team will be doing to make you better and more prepared when you go in to talk to a prospect. So I know that there's you know, a lot of this stuff that's kind of floating around. I'm telling you, it's not a fad. It's really the way it's going to be. There's no turning back now, and it's only going to get more and more challenging. So I believe I have a video that just shows a little bit about how we do it with technology at ADP. Bob Acker from On A Roll Catering is looking for a new payroll provider. Using Radiant 6 Social Monitoring, the lead center can identify a post and then convert it to a lead. Kevin Thigpen is just finishing a call when the lead arrives on his smartphone. You have a new sales lead. Read me input. Robert Acker, Senior Vice President, on a roll catering. Following up on the lead couldn't be easier. Call Robert Acker. Robert Acker. Hi, Mr. Acker. My name is Kevin with ADP, and I'm a district manager. Hi, how are you? We noticed that you posted online this morning for a new payroll provider. Uh, yes, that's correct. Well, I can actually meet with you and provide you with all the details around the various services we offer in that area. Okay. Would you happen to have 10 to 15 minutes today to meet at 11 o'clock? We could really go through things together then. Uh, yes, that'll work. Great. I'll see you then. Great, thank you. With voice prompted scheduling, you don't miss a beat. Schedule a meeting with Robert Acker at 11 o'clock. Meeting schedule. Good luck and good selling. <laughs> Later, Kevin delivers a sales presentation with content dynamically customized to the prospect's data. Can you see how ADP solutions make the perfect fit for your organization? Absolutely. This is fantastic. I can't believe we haven't been using this yet. A successful sale and a new client. New ADP mobile selling solutions. Harnessing the power of social media. Putting sales leads <coughs> at your fingertips. Helping you manage contacts and present solutions at a touch. From ADP Sales and Marketing. So yeah, by the way, all the sales aren't that easy, just so you know. <laughs> Probably have to come back a couple more times, maybe get thrown out of an office or two, but yeah. Um, but that's just kind of a, a little bit of an intro to some of the stuff that's going on around technology and how it's going to change what we do as sales professionals. And you know, every level of sales has different impact. That's in the small market. So um, just want to leave you with uh, a, a couple notes. I'll close up. Uh, I think we're getting near the end of my... Uh, my time, okay. So um, just something I, I, I want to introduce you to that as a topic uh, that's um, just a phrase, actually. And it's a, it's a very important thing. If you just take away this one thing, it's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you can find it within yourself to do that, and it's a very hard thing to do, we all do it, not just old people like me, but we all will do it. You will find something that you're good at, and you will do it, and you will find success with it, and you will just keep doing it. Because why would you change something that's successful? But you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. If there's a new technology that's out, if there's some new process, if you've been reading something, you owe it to yourself to learn a little bit more about it. Try it. Don't, dis don't dismiss it right away. Try it. Because you might find that it's very valuable to you. But if you dismiss it, you will only be slightly more behind the competitor, whoever that is, for the next job, for the next deal. Whatever. And eventually, you'll find yourself as a dinosaur. So I'm telling you, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Take that road. Learn more. Be a student of your competitor. Be a student of the best person, the person ahead of you. If you do all those things, then there's never been a better time to be in sales. So thanks for listening.